Okay, so I'm going to be talking about um, um, some work which is in this paper from last year about um, cell dual P form actions. Um, so, as some of you will know, I've been working for some time on something called double field theory. And so, this, what I'm going to be talking about, could be called, uh, thought about as going in the opposite direction to what you might call half field theory. And the basic idea is. Um, are very familiar. If you look, work with a Q minus one form gauge field with Q form field strength F, then if um, F, the, the rank of if Q is half the dimension, and if moreover, if Q is odd, then you can impose the self duality constraint that F equals the Hodge dual of F, and that halves the degrees of freedom. The reason I want Q to be odd is so that star squared is equal to plus one. If Q were even, then this would um, um, this would only make sense if F were complex. But this works in for Q odd. This works for real F. And, and a, a long-standing uh, question was to find an action for such a self-dual fit for such a self-dual gauge field. You're in Lorentzian signature. A Lorentzian signature throughout. Yes. Um, and uh, it's something which there's been a huge number of papers over the years and lots of different approaches. And um, the approach I'm going to be talking about today is one proposed by Ashok Sen, which was inspired by string field theory. He, he had constructed a string field theory for the type 2b string, and that must include, and since the type 2b supergravity includes a four-form gauge field with self-dual um, field strength, in other words, exactly an object of this kind where d equals 10 and q equals uh, 5, um, then um, that string field theory should um, have to include a, a solution of how to do this. And um, this approach has got a number of um, advantages over um, other approaches. First of all, it gives a, an action which is quadratic, which means it's well set up for quantization. Um, is that the quantization is uh, relatively straightforward in principle. And also it's one which generalizes to allow Born-Infeld interactions and also Chern-Simons interactions. So modifying this constraint to, to something more general. And um, so it's an action which is, um, has a lot going for it, um, but it's rather strange uh, in lots of ways, in a number of ways. So we're working in a Lorentzian space with respect to a Lorentzian space-time metric G mu nu, but its action, um, as I'll sh show in a moment, in involves explicitly a Minkowski metric, A to mu nu, and involves Hodge duals with us both respect to the metric and to the um, Minkowski metric. And the fields in his action coupled to eta and then there's a weird interaction term depending on G mu nu and eta. And the output of this are two, uh, are two self-dual gauge fields. One which, which is a, um, a form A with field strength F, which is self-dual with respect to the space-time metric, uh, which is the field we're after, but it gives something else. It gives another gauge field of the same rank, a Q of, 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 of Q minus one form gauge field with field strength G, which is self dual with respect to the eta. And so A couples to the space time metric and also to the other physical fields. But this extra thing couples to none of the other physical fields and so decouples. So um, the key way in which um, Sen's action works and manages to give a nice action to A is at the expense of introducing an extra field, which is um, which doesn't couple to the space-time metric and doesn't couple to any of the other fields, and so drops out of the physical uh, degrees of freedom, but it's in there uh, somehow to make the quantum to make the full theory work. So this setup these has got a number has got a number of issues. Um, having a, a Minkowski metric is uh, very restrictive. Most space times don't admit a flat metric. Uh, and, um, and moreover, it, it's the way it enters means that it can't properly be, in, this eta can't properly be understood as a, um, as a 
tangent space metric, it really is some kind of space time metric. And the presence of this um, also raises the question about whether the action is properly caught, whether it's really coordinate invariant. Um, and um, so one of the questions, and, so, and that's a problem. It has a strange symmetry, which acts like diffeomorphisms on the physical fields, but leaves both this non-physical field C and also eta invariant. So it's not um, standard diffeomorphism symmetry, it is rather strange. And it's hard to work with explicitly. If you look at the details in Sam's paper, the um, strange interaction, um, the um, weird interaction term involving G um, is effective, uh, is um, given by an infinite sum of interactions. He has to solve an equation and he presents an action, a solution in terms of a power series. Um, what one would like would be a, co a, a coordinate independent theory that could be formulated on any space time. For example, um, well, my, what, what would be interested in constructing an action which would work on anti de Sitter space, for example, in constructing looking at an action from 2v supergravity on ADS5 cross S5, um, where, and the 2v supergravity includes a four form gauge field with self dual field strength. Maybe you could just say a little bit more about the sense theory, because it's so bizarre, you think it's got to be, you know, how could it possibly work? Yeah, so that's what I'm going to do on the next slide. So introducing, so, so far I'm just introducing the concepts of what I want to try and do. Then I'm going to introduce, I'm going to write down sense theory and say a bit more about it, and then talk about my, um, my proposal for how to get around these um, issues. Uh, any other questions at this stage before we go into a bit more detail? Okay. Um, so my um, generalization of this um, is to replace, uh, is a straightforward one to replace, in principle, is to replace um, the ATM you knew with, a, with a, another metric, which I'll call G bar, and then replace ATA with G bar everywhere throughout sense theory and I'll do this explicitly in a moment. And then um, the extra field G is now self-dual with respect to this G bar instead of the eta. And the hard bit in this is finding the interaction term between G and G bar and showing it gives the required field equations. Um, as a result of this, we end up with a physical sector involving G and A plus the, all the other physical fields, for example, in the 2B supergravity, this would involve all the other physical fields, all the other supergravity fields, all of which couple to each other. And then there's a non-physical sector, which would involve G bar and C, and these couple to each other, now that C is self-dual, that this is self-dual with respect to G bar. Um, so the field equation for G, G um, is then involves G bar, but capital G involves um, covariant derivatives with respect to G bar. Um, they couple to each other, but not to any of the other physical fields. So we've got a sort of shadow, shadow sector or a physical non-physical sector, um, as well as the usual physical sector. Um, so it gives the desired physical sector plus a shadow sector that decouples. And moreover, uh, I'm able to give the solution in um, the, everything in a closed form, not just an infinite sum. Uh, because um, I'm using a geometric approach where I can put, sort out what's going on there. And this, and this closed form helps uh, in quantum calculations. Uh, and as a result, um, we end up with a space time with two metrics, um, G, the, phys space, the physical dynamical metric, and, an, and, and another one. And mathematically, this is quite interesting. It's a structure which doesn't seem to be uh, the interest uh, looked at so much by mathematicians, uh, uh, ma uh, looking at a space time equipped with two different metrics. Um, and there's new structures which arise in this. And this geometry is important in the technical bits, in particular in constructing the interactions and showing that they're uh, properly covariant. Um, this extra metric could be uh, have work in two ways. It could be taken as a fixed background metric or we could take it as uh, dynamical if we introduce um, a kinetic term for G bar, which doesn't couple to any of the physical fields. 
And rather interestingly, it's very, a rather similar kind of biometric structure arises in recently deconstructed theories, or not so recently now, um, theories of massive gravity by Duran, Gavadazzi, and Toddy, and generalizations of that to an interacting theory of two gravitons of Hassan and Rosen and many others since then. So uh, uh, I, won't, I won't say much more about this kind of theory, but it's, um, it's rather interesting that the same um, kind of stru mathematical structures also play a role in that story. Uh, the question, when you said that the, the G bar doesn't couple any of the dynamical fields, yeah. you know, that interaction F of G, G bar, so G is not dynamical, or, or get that interaction? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, that's, a, that's a very good point, and, I, and I'm going to explain precisely what I mean by that in a moment. Um, so the point is that, um, okay, so just going back, um, this G is dynamical, but it couples, doesn't couple to the physical metric. It only couples to um, the background metric, so, and whereas this couples to the real dynamical metric, little g. Um, so, um, so there's a question about whether, so big G is dynamical, and g, but little g, but little g bar could be either dynamical or a fixed background. But the little s couples g and g bar together, so don't. Yes, um, but like so I'm going to, this is something I'm going to come to in a moment. It's one of the strange things that this f, which I'm going to talk about, is um, is constructed from other fields in sense theory in a rather strange way and. Um, when I come to that point and write down those equations, I'll come back to that point and try and explain that carefully. But that's that's a very good question. Um, right. So it ends up with a kind of double geometry after all. We have we don't double the space time, but we've got two kinds of metric. Um, if we think of in the linearized theory um, for two different metrics, we'd expect two kinds of gauge symmetries. Uh, one was one for this metric and one for this one. And um, this, in fact, is true for the full theory I'll write down. And these ex both of these extend to symmetries of the full theory. Um, the zeta symmetries trans uh, act as transformations on the physical sector and other, phys um, uh, but doesn't act on the shadow sector. And the chi transformations act on the shadow sector, but not on the physical sector. So the zeta ones transformations are um, correspond to um, the symmetries that Sen found in his theory, and the real diffeomorphisms would um, will be a diagonal subgroup. After all, diffeomorphisms of transformation detectors, uh, coordinate transformations, have to act on everything, and um, the diagonal subgroup of these two um, D does that. So. Um, Ask one more question. Yeah, the A and C fields have the same chirality or opposite? Chirality? The same, the same chirality, but with respect to different metrics. One is self-dual with respect to G. One is respect to um, G bar. Right, but if you space specialize to flat space, they would have the same chirality. Yeah. So, so it's the, the same, the same not, sign. So this is not the usual attempt. To look They're both self-dual or both anti-self-dual, um, and uh, with respect to metrics which could be different, but. Um, any more questions before I get into the details? Um, start talking more explicitly about the seven metric. Okay. So, sense action um, involves two fields. One was a, a Q minus one form field P, um, and one is a Q form field which is self dual with respect to eta. So this is going back to Sen's action where there's an explicit data appearing in the action. So um, here we have a standard kinetic term um, for um, the gauge field for P, which is a standard Q minus one for gauge field. It's just the square of the field strength coupled to eta. And then the Q form appears with a, a Q wedge DP term. And then there's an interaction term which involves uh, a function of Q, which for the moment will take to be a linear function. So it takes a Q form to a Q form, um, and there's some M, some coefficients here, 
which will depend on, um, in particular, on G and G bar. And um, so um, if we um, define um, capital G to be given by um, the self dual part of the field strength of P with respect to eta plus Q, this gives a field which is um, by construction self dual with respect to eta. And um, it's field and the field equations which follow from this action then imply that um, this is closed. And because it's self dual, it will then satisfy the field equations in Minkowski space. And then um, the trick is uh, as follows. Um, but we define F to be Q plus M of Q, which is this linear function on Q. And um, the trick is to choose M so that um, the field equations from this action imply that F is self-dual with respect to um, the real space-time metric G. And that means that this M must be constructed from, uh, must have explicit dependence on the space-time metric G, and that's the only place where this occurs. And um, it's rather re remarkable that N can be chosen in such a way, but when, but when you do that, then you find um, that, um, an action which works this way. So here we see that um, both um, F and G are composites of um, the fundamental fields which appear in the action, which are Q and P. And uh, um, one way of thinking about it is when you look at the field equations that follow from this action, they're quite complicated. And using these definitions, these effectively diagonalizes or disentangles those equations. So you can see the, uh, the field content. And rather remarkably, because although Q and P coupled to eta um, and only coupled to um, the space-time metric through the G appearing in here. Um, nonetheless, uh, when you rewrite in terms of these fields, the field equation, the solution of the field equation in terms of these fields, we get this, um, we get F, which is self-dual with respect to the metric, and G, which is self-dual with respect to uh, the other field. Sorry, so this self-duality is just a um, shared property then. This is the right complication. No, um, F. This is it's the self duality implies is implied by the definition, but it's the field equations imply the closure and hence the co closure of these two fields. So here the G is manifestly self dual, and the field equation tells you that it's closed. And similarly, F is not manifestly, but in fact, by from construction, is self dual without using the field equations. Um, but um, the field equations then imply that it's closed, um, which is, so that's a good point. And uh, because these are closed, these imply locally there are potentials so that um, G and F, G is DC and F is DA. And another strange thing is that um, if one looks at the Hamiltonian analysis, as Sen did, one finds that it uh, effectively um, G has negative energy and F has positive energy. Um, so in a sense, the field, uh, if there was a, so it's as if there's, it appears in the action with, uh, if it did appear in the action with the wrong side. So, um, so it's just as well that it doesn't couple to the physical metric and decouples from the other fields, or otherwise there would be an issue. So the new action is, um, the equations are the same as on the last slide, but I just replace eta by G bar everywhere. So the, there's a metric G bar occurring here. And so this G is self dual with respect to um, G bar. The same F is, is, is um, self-dual with respect to the physical metric. And uh, these equations follow the field equations. And again, this implies the local potentials. Uh, 
So this term in the action, um, as I've mentioned, gives an interaction between Q and the two metrics. And the action gives a complicated theory of these four um, fields which appear in the action, but gives a simple theory for capital G and capital F, um, where F interacts with G, little g, and big G interacts with uh, little g bar, but there's no interactions between the physical sector and the shadow sector. So the hard part is understanding the interactions, um, the construction of this um, term um, M of Q and this interaction. And so I'm gonna say, take a few minutes to say a little bit about how that works and how that's related to the geometry. Uh, so uh, I introduce something which I refer to as an interpolating structure, which is an object with two indices, which tells you, which takes, takes you between G bar and G. So it could be thought of as a generalization of a field line. And given, so, if, if there is such a metric, such an object, this will give us a map um, on forms where you just act by, um, with a, a whole set of Fs on each of the lower indices. And this converts between the Hodge duals for the two kinds of metric. So that if the Hodge dual of with respect to G bar is mapped to um, the dual um, with respect to um, G. So it, in particular, it maps G bar self dual forms to G self dual forms. And so it's the sort of thing which is needed to um, look at um, understanding disentangling this kind of theory. So one example of such an object is if you take a field by an E bar for uh, this metric and a field by an E for this metric, then the field by an, for, e, for G times the inverse field by an E bar for G bar satisfies this equation. Um, but um, there are many other solutions. And um, in some cases, this might be a global tensor field, um, or more generally, it could be only defined locally in patches. So the field binds are defined locally in patches and in intersect and overlaps between patches are related by Lorentz transformations or um, tangent space rotations, uh, as well as diffeomorphisms. And, um, and that leads to corresponding uh, transition functions for these Fs, which could be, which in the paper I go through and work out. Um, so, um, this, this, these maps can either be local or global, and all I need for what I'm going to talk about is that they exist locally in patches. So what I want to do is look at the construction of um, M of Q. So given a starting point is a Q, which is self-dual with respect to G bar, and the aim is to construct an F, which is Q plus some M of Q, such that this F is self-dual, with respect to the space-time metric. Now we have this map here, which takes um, G bar self-dual forms to G self-dual forms, and it's invertible. So I can use its inverse um, to map this self-dual form to something which I'll call U, which will be then self-dual with respect to G bar. And then, um, F um, will be um, the it will then F, which is Q plus M, will be the image of this U under phi, um, clearly. And notationally, I'll, instead of writing phi of U, I'll write phi as, think of phi as a linear operator acting on U. So I'll write phi U instead of phi, um, phi acting on U, uh, just to simplify the notation and what follows. So introducing projectors with respect to um, self dual to, onto self dual and anti self dual with respect to G bar, I can take um, F and decompose it into F plus and F minus, which are so F is self dual with respect to G. So I can look at the self dual and anti self dual parts with respect to the wrong metric G bar, and um, Q was self dual with respect to um, G bar. Um, so F plus is Q, 
and F, the rest of it will be, it turns out to be, uh, as well as easily checked, is anti self dual. But um, F plus is, so F is phi of U. So um, I can write F plus as being the projector on phi of U. Um, and that means that this is an operator N acting on U, which is um, this projector times this map phi to times this projector again, because um, this, because U is, um, and it is self dual with respect to um, phi plus. So, is, so I can introduce that in there to make just to do that. And I can do a similar thing for the other part. And this will define another operator, k, of, k acting on u, which is phi with this projection onto um, with the anti self dual and self dual projectors appearing there. So given these two equations, we can then aim to eliminate u to, to then um, give m as a function of q. And the key thing is that this is to introduce a generalized inverse, something which acting on n gives pi, which gives this projector. And in the paper, I show that such an inverse um, always exists. And then, um, we can invert, we can invert um, the relation um, F plus um, Q equals N U to give U equals N tilde, the generalized inverse acting on Q. And then substituting this in this equation then gives M explicitly in terms of this operator. And um, it turns out that this um, M of Q is globally well-defined, even if the interpolating structure um, that I introduced and played a role in the intermediate stages is only defined locally. And I go to, again, I go through the analysis in detail in the paper. Um, so to show what this looks like um, for the simplest case in two dimensions, where we're talking about a two-dimensional chiral boson, I can just show you explicit, very explicitly what this looks like. So I introduced the spy bind um, for the background metric or the, the shadow metric G bar. Um, and I use um, plus or minus uh, indices here for the self dual and anti-self dual with respect to G bar. So plus means the self-dual part and minus the anti-self-dual part, explicitly given this way. And I use, um, I introduce um, a partial with an, a flat index in the usual way. So that um, this is um, here, the plus here is a flat index. So this involves this construction. So then the action I wrote down um, is, takes this form. Q is self-dual, so it only has a plus component, and uh, M only has minus minus components because Q only has plus components. Then G plus is just given um, by this derivative of P this, um, plus Q plus, and F has got two parts. One is Q plus, and the other part is M minus minus acting on Q plus. The field equations work in this way, provided uh, M is chosen in the right way. And the, and the story I showed you on the last few slides gives M very explicitly uh, in this form, which is given constructed from G bar and G. Here, uh, this G plus plus is the inverse metric um, written in flat components with respect to the wrong, to the G bar metric. Um, and this D is this object which is constructed but from the, the scalar constructed from these two metrics. And written in this way, it's manifestly covariant. Um, and, um, and then one can check that putting this M in here, we indeed get um, these field equations together with the fact that G and F are closed. So, um, I want to, so that's the way the action works. And I want to say a little bit about the symmetries. So we have two kinds, 
two metrics and so two kinds of diffeomorphism um, symmetry. So this is um, essentially the slide, slide I showed earlier. Um, so there's the back, there's the um, the symmetries for the G and the symmetries of, for G bar, which are called zeta and chi. And um, these act on the physical sector, these on the shadow sector, on the real diffeomorphisms of a diagonal subgroup. Um, we know how the real diffeomorphisms act, and I wrote in the, the action in the last slide in a way which was manifestly, the last few slides in a way which, um, in which diffeomorphism symmetry was manifest. So I need to set, so the thing which is non-obvious is um, how to construct either the zeta or the chi transformations. Because these are the diagonal subgroup, if you know the zeta transformations, you can then construct what the chi transformations are. And um, the zeta transformations which act on the physical sector um, don't act on G bar and C. And explicitly the transformations on the uh, terms appearing in the action for an infinitesimal zeta are given by these equations. This notation means that you're contracting one of the indices of F with the vector field zeta to make uh, take a Q form to a Q minus one form. And these imply um, that the variation of F is just, is the lead derivative of F. In other words, the diffeomorphism transformation up to terms which vanish on shell. So on shell, these look like diffeomorphisms, but they off shell, they're a little different. Um, and these are the symmetries which play a key role in this story. Um, I've talked so far about constructing a free um, self-dual um, form. Um, there are a couple of, uh, the, the, it could be generalized to, cons to, for, to allow interactions and um, very briefly, one way of you can introduce nonlinear born infeld type interactions, which in, which are higher derivative interactions, by instead of having m of q being a linear operator on q, to have it being a, a nonlinear operator, and as a result, we get a self duality equation where f minus is a um, a function of the self dual part of f where these are the minus and plus with respect to um, the wrong metric, if you recall. And this R is essentially given by a, a variation of M with respect to Q. And um, it's, one has to be a little bit more careful how to define this because we are varying the spectra matrix, but um, I give the formula in the paper. And churn simons interactions can be added by adding matter couplings to the action in such a way that the field equations then give um, the self-duality for a field strength with uh, a churn simons term, where the churn simons term is constructed from other gauge fields in the theory. And that plays a key role in, for example, in writing down the 2B supergravity action, where A is a four-fold gauge field. And also in six dimensions, where A would be a two-fold gauge field. And that also plays a role in supergravity theories. And the details of the interactions are again in the paper. Um, but what I want to do now is say a little bit more about the story involved in the two metrics and what that implies. So there are two kinds of metrics. So there are two kinds uh, uh, two kinds of symmetries, and hence um, two different kinds of conserved charges. So there's a, a kind of physical mass, which is the standard thing, um, and the fields um, in the shadow sector don't have any mass with respect of that kind. And there's a shadow mass, which is related to um, G bar, and um, only, the, only um, the shadow fields, the fields in the shadow sector have, have that kind of mass, and all the fields in the physical sector don't couple to G bar and don't carry that kind of mass or energy. And um, um, I'm treating this metric G mu nu as a metric tensor field in the usual way, uh, giving rise to the physical gravitational field. And the conventional thing to do, and that's the way I've been talking about it so far in this talk, is to take G bar to be a second metric tensor field. And what that means is when you look at um, trying to glue um, this field together from local from data in local patches, then the um, 
the relationships between the components of G bar in two different coordinate patches is given by a diffeomorphism in the usual way, uh, which was um, a physical diffeomorphism. And it's the same transition functions which occur for this metric G. And so this would be the standard story. And um, it's, um, it's very natural. Um, but given that there are these two types of there's this extra symmetries which occur in the theory, there's a rather intriguing other possibility. And that's, so, well, before going on to that, um, the diffeomorphisms um, here, just to say a bit more detail, um, the diffeomorphisms act infinitesimally in this way, and globally you'd get have some function phi. And, um, the, stat, the way the metric transforms is given by um, the, um, the, uh, the push forward of this um, coordinate map. So, um, but the unconventional way is to allow it to have a corner trans uh, transition functions, which as well as having diffeomorphisms, have these extra spin two gauge transformations occurring in the transition functions. So it's a bit as the, if we looked at a Yang Mills field when we glued together um, local data for a Yang Mills field and to construct it on the manifold, then it overlaps between patches. It's a vector field, so you'd have um, the changes of um, the transition functions involved in the diffeomorphisms, but you'd also allow um, the transition function to involve a Yang Mills gauge transformation. Here um, we can try we could treat um, this other vector other um, field as a gauge field, so we can allow diffeomorphisms plus the gauge transformations of um, for, the, for which this is a gauge field, and both applying here. Um, and one thing you immediately notice is that these are, unlike the Yang Mills case, these are exactly of the same form. Um, so in particular, um, it allows the possibility of um, choosing um, this transformation to cancel this transformation, leaving G bar invariant. So, how am I doing it? Okay. So the conventional uh, geometry, if we should think a little bit about the, uh, the story, um, that here we take G bar to being a conventional tensor on the manifold N. And um, so it's, what that means is it's, um, uh, given by the symmetric product, it's, it lives in the, um, the space of symmetric tensors on the manifold. It's a section of this bundle in mathematical language. Whereas in the uh, unconventional case, if we chose a um, set of open sets which covered the manifold, uh, we have a symmetric tensor defined on each coordinate patch ui, and on the uh, intersection, we'd allow an active diffeomorphism, um, sigma ij, and provided they had a consistency condition when you had a triple, of, a triple intersection of these uh, patches. And the transition functions would be um, um, a, a diffeomorphism generated by this um, vector field pi um, in, defined in each overlap. And so they'd be related um, by the equations we had I talked about before. And in this unconventional case, um, we could choose a particular case where chi equals minus psi, as I mentioned before, which would um, allow the possibility of um, taking G, the variation of G bar to be zero, so that um, we could take G bar to be the same for example, eta in every patch, um, as um, Ashok did, and this would give um, a, a particular, and this would give a uh, an interpretation of Ashok's action and shows how it could work globally. Uh, and it requires taking an unconventional approach in which G bar is not a tensor field, but which is a gauge field which transforms under both of these um, uh, transformations and in such a way that these cancel out. Um, I just, they would cancel out at the linearized level as I showed here, but in fact, it works to all orders at the nonlinear level. So um, 
that's gone a little quicker than I expected. Uh, um, so I want to, um, so it brings me to the conclusion. Um, since, um, action, since action for chiral form fields has been uh, generalized in a way which is okay for general space times. So for example, on anti de Sitter space, you could take G bar to be the um, anti de Sitter metric and G to be a dynamical metric, which was asymptotically anti de Sitter in that background. Um, the supergravity field. And what we've seen is that there's an extra shadow sector um, which is introduced, which decouples from the physical fields. And the origin of this from Ashok Sen's point of view was his string field theory, where for his string field theory, he needed to introduce a, sh a shadow string field. So as well as the string field which um, contained the physical fields, it, there was another string field which was an auxiliary or shadow field which um, described non-physical degrees of freedom. And that was the origin of what led to this construction in uh, Sen's case. Um, as I mentioned, the shadow sector metric can be either a, a fixed background metric or it could be dynamical. And by adding a, a einstein hilbert term for G bar, you can make it dynamical and as long as there's no interactions between G bar and G, that's perfectly consistent. And so you could um, have um, you could have a setup where you set up initial conditions and then you and then evolved have to see how both G and G bar evolved. Uh, the story is the setup is good for quantum calculations, in particular the action for Q and P is quadratic in um, Q and P. And so the calculation, the calculation of integrating out um, the gauge field, the fields Q and P is straightforward, um, but will give complicated dependence on the metrics and in particular their moduli uh, in an interesting way. And uh, at the moment I'm doing uh, some work in progress with Neil Lambert looking explicitly in, uh, at the quantum calculations which arise in this way. As I um, mentioned, it generalizes um, to allow born Infeld and Chern Simons interactions. Uh, and that's um, something which works very well um, for this theory and is, um, is, is a, a, um, other approaches which uh, people have tried for writing actions for self dual gauge fields. Um, um, introducing interactions is more problematic. One of the strange features of this theory is that the physical gauge field A uh, isn't a fundamental field, but is constructed, but is uh, constructed from the fields which appear in the action, and that's um, rather strange and unexpected, and um, and that's something which um, I think needs um, is, is an area which needs some further understanding. Uh, there are other, approach, other approaches to self-dual, um, constructing actions with self-dual forms have A as fundamental, but they have other issues and, uh, and uh, problems. So, um, but, um, and it's for, for this reason, and for these reasons, nonetheless, it seems that the sin approach seems to be um, one of the better actions we have at the moment. And the fact that it's good for quantum calculations, it's very promising. But I think one of the um, most interesting, one of the very interesting things which comes out of this story is the, um, the mathematical or geometric side of that. And the story involving the biometric geometry with two kinds of metrics and um, the kind of structure which involved in that, the constructed, uh, particular the mathematics of these interpolating structures, which turned out to be a key, played a key role in constructing the interactions. And the possibility of having um, tensor gauge fields, spin two tensor gauge fields, um, and which have, um, as well as diffeomorphisms, have um, spin two gauge translations in their transition functions. And this is also a story which would occur, in, which arise for um, the theories of um, 
interact um, theories with two or more metric, um, two or more um, um, gravitons, um, two, two or more spin two gauge fields with interactions of the kind um, I referred to earlier in the introduction. And I think it will be very interesting to explore this side of things and its implications um, further. So I'll stop there and thank you for your attention. I think with the jet lag, I must have talked much more quickly. When I gave this talk before, it was it went for over an hour. So, so. any questions? Yeah. Yeah, there are yeah, there are other actions, um, but they have um so they have so they each have pros and cons, and that's um I mean one of the questions is um one of the issues for a lot of these actions is whether it gives so for string theory, when you're looking at Carl Boson, for example. Um, well, if you're looking at a non chiral boson, you get a, if you look at the partition function, for example, you find an, um, a result which has the property of holomorphic factorization. And if you've got, it's a modulus of um, squared of a holomorphic function of the moduli. And one of the problems is how to take a square root of that. Um, in string theory, we want, we, we want to find a way of constructing. Um, quantizing so that we get the holomorphic square root of that. Um, a lot of the other approaches um, will give a non-holomorphic square root. Um, and um, one of the things with the florianini jakeith story is it involves a, a story of boundary conditions and then integrating up from the boundary conditions using the field equations to get this, the self-duality equation. Um, and um, there's issues about how that works at the quantum level and whether it really um, describes just the right degrees of freedom or whether there's, um, whether it gives the right thing um, story. So, the, I mean, so the, you can write the 2B action using this. Yeah. So Sen already wrote down the 2B supergravity action using his formulas and then by replacing um, them, my, my story will then work in that case too. And then in particular, you will tell, uh, tell me how to write it down on AES5 process 5, which was a problem for Sen because he did sort of be, um, it wasn't clear that his action, how his action would make sense on a city space. Because anti decisive space doesn't allow Minkowski metric. Can you say more about the quantum calculations? What what are you calculating? Is the um, yeah, so if um Yeah, so if we take, um, so if in two dimensions, um, here, um, effectively, you're looking at um, integrating out the P's and Q's um, and calculating, um, and doing the calculation here. And the integrating out the P's and Q's is, um, is um, straightforward because this is a quadratic action. And what happens, what effectively what this means is, if you were to um, eliminate um, the Q's um, from this action, you'd end up with the P's um, coupling to um, a two-dimensional metric, which was constructed using uh, G bar and capital M. And um, then the story would be that you'd look at the way M is depended on the metrics, the two metrics, and that would tell you how it depended on the two kinds of moduli. And um, 
and then you, you could calculate the partition function and um, the um, kinds of and the and then interactions between uh, the correlation functions of vertex operators. Um, uh, Sen in his original paper um, already talked about the Feynman rules which follow from this action. So it's, um, it's straightforward to, um, in principle, to do the calculations. And it's um, just a question of um, sorting that out and trying to understand how the, um, the geometry works out. Very naive question about this, but how do you regularize this theory in such a way that you don't destroy all of the self dual structure? So how do you re regularize UV divergences? Um, yeah, so that's, um, so that's, that's, um, you know, long been a problem, for example, when you're looking at, um, looking at calculating sort of for sig models with Vesemino terms and so on, there's always a question about how you regularize with the epsilon tensor, uh, and conventional dimensional regularization has problems with the epsilon tensor. Um, but there's a, a variant of that, which is sometimes called dimensional reduction, which deals with that in a slightly different way, um, and which m maintains the self-duality self -duality properties. If you're looking at, for example, looking at a calculation on the torus, then um, one can do this, um, one can relate this to mode sums and use a zeta function regularization, as one would normally do in that story. But um, as always, um, there's a problem with a regularization. And it, in the end, the quantum calculation can never depend on the way you regularize it, but um, that you, may, you may need to add finite local counter terms to, um, to, to deal with that and get the results in the covariant form. But that's, um, in, but that's always um, a bit, so it's, but it's a problem which is no worse than when you're looking at the heterotic, well, G calculations in the heterotic stream, for example. The, the usual difficulties apply there, but um, we've, I think we've gained an understanding of what the right answer should look like. That's a good point. <laughs>